Brian Windhorse, ESPN senior NBA writer, kind enough to join us. He'll be uh, part of the jump and uh, ESPN News information platforms covering the NBA and the return here closely. And Brian joins us. Are you going to the bubble, Brian? I don't think so. But ha- the reason I have to say don't think is because they haven't announced the media rules yet. Not that that's a big priority. But um, we don't know. We don't know what the, what the law of the land is going to be. We have to hear about it. What are your, what's your, do you have a, uh, like a singular biggest concern here going into this uh, and what they're trying to pull off? Yeah, I, I have two. Uh, one is that, and, it, and, and, I'm, and my guess is it, was, it would be a star player, but it could be anybody, is that somebody comes down with the virus and the players just lose confidence in the entire thing. And whether there's an outbreak or not, they say, I don't want to do this anymore, and they defect. Um, the other concern I have is of a genuine outbreak where, you know, there's a lag time. It is, as much as the NBA is doing here, and they are doing everything, just about everything that we know to do, um, is that they're, they're, they miss it, somebody gets sick and infects five or six other people, and it's an outbreak to the point where not only do you have to shut it down, but it becomes unclear whether you're going to be able to restart it again anytime in the near future. That, I think, would be a worst-case scenario. How many name players have you heard from off the record that might not go? Um, I guess it depends on your definition of the word name players. Um, from my read on folks, everyone is ready to go. Okay. Um, whether they're going to be ready to go in, uh, in a month when this actually starts is a different question. You know, yesterday the Toronto Raptors left to go to Florida to begin this because of you know, issues with Canada, U.S. border crossings, they had to leave early. And if they make it back to the finals, that's a long shot, but if they make it back to the finals, Dan, they wouldn't be back home until October. October. That means they left yesterday (laughs) with the possibility they would not be back until the fall. Explain what the deadline means tomorrow. So the players have until tomorrow to raise their hands and say, I'm not going. Uh, but that I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest. The, the NBA is changing the rules all the time. It's not like we have a 15-year history of this playbook working. Um, if somebody says they decide they don't want to play in three weeks, do I think the NBA is going to like put them in shackles and force them into into an airplane? No, I do not. Um, but the reason that they have to tell the teams now is that for the next week, starting at noon today a transaction window opens that you can sign replacement players. And if you want to be able to replace a player who's either injured or who's, um, uh, you know, doesn't want to go or has some sort of other concern, you you have to do it within the next seven days. So that's why this window opens by today's deadline. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm curious about the roster size here too, Brian, we're seeing with major league baseball that they're going to have to expand the rosters you know, just in case or when it happens that somebody tests positive, how much of a talent pool will these NBA teams have to draw from? Not much. Uh, you know, most NBA teams have two minor league players. It's kind of like having options on a baseball contract. You can call the guys up a certain amount of time. So they kind of have those two guys. There's a there's a few guys kicking around out there who are free agents who may be decent additions, uh, but, you know, you lose a starting line player, you're not going to replace them with a starting line player. You're going to replace them with a warm body. And I think one of the concerns here is, remember, they're going to play three weeks of these regular season games before the playoffs start. If you're in ninth or tenth place and you lose – the first two or three games and you're out of it and you're still faced with being in that bubble for another two weeks. Are you just going to say, forget this, I'm going home. And because the NBA is not stopping anybody from leaving. Now, if you leave, want to come back. Now we have a problem, but if you leave, they're not going to say stop. And so that's a bit of a concern. What happens to that group of players in the offing? Because you are going to be committed to being there for five or six weeks. There's two and a half or three weeks of training camp. Then these eight games, you know, over the course of two and a half, three weeks, you may be tired of being there if you're in ninth place and have no chance of advancing. You're not doing a good job of dressing this up, Brian. 
Sorry. <laughs> Do you got a sneaky team? So the team that has underperformed all year long has been the Philly 76ers. And nobody can figure out why they would be 29-2 and two at home. Because I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> to be 29-2 and two at home, you've got to be a damn good team. And you look at their roster, and you know that their talent doesn't exactly fit together. But there's some really good players there. And they're, they were like below five. They were like 13 and 15 on the road and 29 and two at home. Okay, well, guess what? They don't have to play. They don't get to play home games anymore. That's a disadvantage. But that is a good team. And if they could align together and hit their, you know, hit some sort of stride, they could really be dangerous. The other thing I want to see is what the hell happened to Nikola Jokic? He <laughs> lost somewhere. My guess is 40 to 50 pounds. When I saw him last year, I was over in China for the uh, World Cup. He was playing on the Serbian team. He was not interested at all in that in, in being in condition. I would say from last summer, I would guess he's down 60 to 70 pounds. I have no idea what he's going to look like. That's a huge question mark to me. Yeah, but Marcus Saul looks like he's on the same diet. Marcus Saul has been losing weight steadily over the last five years, and Marcus Saul is not the number one player on a team that's a, you know on that team. Nikola Jokic is a first team All NBA player who just lost forty pounds in three months. Will that make him <laughs> an MVP candidate, or will that make him something else? I, I, I mean, I think it's one of the most fascinating things I want to see. I want I'm going to be watching the the Nuggets scrimmage games that they're going to have in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Maybe you you write up a story on the Jokic diet. We find out what that workout regimen is because I could probably I, institute that here on my show. I've got to hear. He hasn't given an interview yet. Not only that, though, I'm going to tell you, he was just photographed last week hanging out with uh, the Joker, uh, Novak Djokovic, oh, boy. over in Serbia. Well, Djokovic has got coronavirus now. <laughs> today, Dan, today all the players are are being tested. Okay, now... Now, Jokic would have just come back in the country and, you know, would have, would it, before he. It'd be 100 some odd guys are being tested by today. Now, last week we saw the NFL. They said they tested 200 people. I'll take them at their word. And 11 tested positive. I did not go to Harvard, but I think that's 5%. <laughs> If you have 300 NBA players testing, and let's just say it's roughly the same rate, around 5%, you're going to have, you know, 15 to 20 that number who are test positive. And here's something that the NBA has not articulated very well. If I was a skeptical guy, I would say it's on purpose, but I can't say that. If you test positive <laughs> under their rules, 14 days, no exercise, not 14 days, isolation 14 days in your bed and then you've got to test negative twice in 24 hours and so with a with question i'm going to have is if a bunch of guys here today test positive or asymptomatic and are asymptomatic in a week that's going to become an issue they're going to be like hey let me get back on the court and they're like no 14 days sir and so that's going to be interesting and, and you know while while teams haven't announced the players who have tested positive in the past for hipaa reasons it's going to become pretty apparent if you don't see your team's backup shooting guard for 10 days, you're going to know that he's come down with it. So I don't know how that's all going to work when you understand that some of these guys are going to say, I, I don't feel sick. It's going to be an issue. He's Brian Windhorst, ESPN senior NBA writer. The Lakers reportedly working out at uh, a billionaire's home. What do we know about this story here, Brian? I've been there. <laughs> Oh. Um, this guy, Steve Jackson, he, I think he sold the company a long time ago, he, but he founded LA gear. You remember LA yeah. gear? Yeah. Uh, Shaq had the LA gear deal. He built a, uh, a gym on his property in Bel Air. Uh, and he re made a replica of the Staples center. The court <laughs> is the exact same court, except instead of saying Staples center in the same stenciling, it says Jackson center. He's got photos all over the walls of teams that have come there and players that have come there throughout the years and, and worked out. It's in a gated community. I, when I went there, I had to go through the gate. And he comes out and hangs out with the players 
as they do. There's been commercials filmed there over the years. Teams have used that to shoot around. Uh, it, it's basically been a, a sort of a secret underground NBA hub. And, you know, uh, I'm sure it's been available to many players. And that's the thing. Um, one of the reasons why these NBA players were not coming to work out of team facilities is because they had to follow all of these rules that the NBA put down. Whereas if they go to another place, a run, that they can get a private gym, they can do whatever they feel is necessary to keep themselves safe. And so that's why I think today's testing, what, you know, it'll take a few days for it to come back. Who knows when they'll actually announce it, if they ever will. That's why I think today's test is going to be very interesting. We're going to have guys who don't think they're sick or feel fine who end up coming up positive. Uh, one other item has to do with Knicks, uh, so it's not a playoff team, but it does have to do with the Bucks. Jason Kidd uh, given permission by the Lakers to interview for the Knicks job and then – you know, the possibility of bringing in the Greek freak. Um, what do you make of this with uh, Jay Kidd and the Knicks? Well, look, I, the Knicks have a long way to go before they can even think about getting any free agents. And, uh, you know, Giannis has the opportunity this summer to extend for, you know, we'll see how it happens with the salary cap, but for more than $200 million. Um, But I will say that I think Jason Kidd and Jim Dolan have a really good relationship. Um, and Jason has been interested in going back there. Remember, he played there one year at the end of his career and was a transformational figure. So I still think it's Tom Thibodeau's job, um, but uh, I, I think the Knicks could do a lot to help themselves with free agents that is outside of some coach they have a connection to. They have done a horrible job for the last 10 years on this. Their decisions, specifically Jim Dolan's decisions in the last month to six weeks, have been very damaging. If anybody thinks that they're going to fix that by just hiring a coach who happens to know a star player, that's a little naive. Can the commit? Does the commissioner have any power over that franchise, Brian? He's tried. He's tried. He's gone to people in the franchise. I mean, I don't think he maybe would ever admit to this, but because it's you know not, it's not sort of deemed fair. But he has gone to people in the franchise and said, "What can the NBA do?" to help the Knicks. And the thing about Jim Dolan, you know, the more people I talk to who've worked for Jim Dolan, a lot of them really like him. But Jim Dolan has a blind spot in that he's got horrible judgment. And he's over the years hired people to help him with that judgment, but he doesn't listen to them. And so you can't help a guy who won't help himself. David Stern tried. David Stern got him to, to hire Donnie Walsh. David Stern tried to get him to hire other people and make moves. Adam Silver has tried. You can't force the guy into making good decisions. You can only help him. He won't accept the help. <laughs> but you have somebody hire advisors to help you, and then you don't listen to the advisors that you're – I mean, it's, it's crazy. Didn't, didn't David Stern help the Knicks once where he fixed the lottery so they could get Patrick Ewing? I mean, that's what we need to do. And no, I'm joking. I'm joking. He's up in heaven yelling at me right now. Let me tell you something. I don't know what happened back then, but I can tell you last year when the Lakers and Knicks were in the lottery, the same final four to get Ja and Zion, and they ended up three and four, and New Orleans and Memphis ended up one and two. All lottery <laughs> conspiracy theories died that night. I'm going to tell you right now. Yes. And, and I, oh boy, if you ever wanted to get Commissioner Stern going, whoo. Do not bring up that lottery was fixed with Patrick Ewing. That was go time for him. Uh, hey, Brian, uh, good luck with everything. Uh, great job. We appreciate your time, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dan. Have a good day. That's Brian Windhorst, ESPN senior NBA writer.